these numbers are great because the people are thinking this or are doing this action on this ad. I'm a big media buyer that is thinking with the behavior of people. This is not just numbers, it's numbers align with people. All right, folks, we're back for another one of your favorite podcasts. One of my favorite humans. I actually met him in person in Dubai. He had probably the favorite presentation of everybody there. Emmanuel Morango, <laughs> how are you? How, how goes it? Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for inviting me, Rabah. I'm always good. I couldn't complain. I always good. You, always better. What about you, Rabah? I'm doing, doing well. I'm happy now because I, I had the some scheduling conflicts and you were so so gracious with moving your schedule around for me i really appreciate that so now that i'm actually talking to you i'm, I'm, I'm even better i'm great now i mean but i still it seems yesterday that we met in dubai i know like, i still love the, the conversation that we started there and we said where to make a podcast we need to continue a podcast with all this stuff all right it needed to happen it needed to happen so as always it might look a little different i am not in my studio office um it, i am in austin but i am in my home office hence the sneakers um, but where does this podcast find you today? Myself in the Canary Islands. Just moved here two months ago. So, you know, I, I told you that I love the sun and I'm following the sun. Here's like 25 degrees all year long. Uh, little raining. Always Spanish people with a smile. So that's why I took the, the chance to say, hey, I stayed three years in Germany. Before I was in Australia, a little bit in Africa, and now it's time for the Canary Islands. Amazing. Right? That's the beauty about having a remote team. Amazing. That's so cool. What? So what was it just the, the climate or what, what brought you to? Do you like the beach? You like being on the island? I lo yeah, I, okay. I love the beach. Uh, I tell you, uh, five years ago or six, I was, you know, the motivational speaker, they, they, they tell you, think about your big goals. Yeah. Thinks about your big dreams. Yeah. And mine was to live next to the beach yeah. uh, in a sunny place all year long with smiling people. Then I said, hmm, the Canary Islands could be the right place. But they had nothing. <laughs> so I moved to Australia even before to, to learn English because I'm Italian by, by background. Yep. And you know that Italians with the English language, there is a conflict, right? Yep. So I needed to push a little bit myself to take the jump with the English first. Then I landed in Germany where I built the, the agency with Daniel yep. that we, we discussed and it's full remote. Now we are with 20 people. So why not better than now moving to, to a place where I can work near, near the beach. That's How it. cool. And you did a little bit, uh, you actually taught English in Kenya, correct? You did a little bit yeah, of Yeah, my first, yeah, I mean, my background is en uh, engineering. So oh, I didn't know that. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that's why I mean we, we felt so nice talking about attribution yeah. and KPIs yeah. and so on. Yeah. Then so my path was uh, engineering. Then I realized that I didn't work. I didn't want the normal job like the manager, you know. Yep. Uh, with the 200, 300 people to manage. Then I said, what do I do with my life? And casually, I typed how to make money in my online. And that's how I started the journey into e-com. <laughs> so my first drop shipping Shopify store in 2017 or 16. Oh, then wow. the first client. Then I realized that I didn't like uh, dealing with the suppliers. Yep. But I enjoyed more doing the marketing. Fast forward. Uh, yeah. Now we are running the agency that you know, like uh, fully on e-com in EU and US. And yeah, life is amazing this way. How incredible. That is really crazy. And so how did you and Daniel connect? Through a mastermind. Really? That, that's why I love, yeah, absolutely. I still own two or three fish dinners to Deepesh Mandeli. I don't know if you know him, but I was supposed to go to a mastermind and he put all of us from all Europe, all US, everywhere in the world in a Facebook group. Uh -huh. We realized that we were living nearby. So we said, hey, let's go for a burger and a beer. Yeah. And that's how, yeah, that's how the agency grew up. Oh my we, gosh. We started talking about Facebook ads, about e-com, how to scale here and there. Two years from now. So and, two years. And this is not, not a lot. Wow. I did not know that at all. And this is when you were in Munich. Yes, exactly. Whoa. Exactly. And so, so <laughs> and do you speak German or no? 
yeah, I can survive. Okay. I can survive. No, speaking is another thing, right? Mm. Being really fluent. Right. So I'm Italian. I can I say I can communicate with English because the pronunciation is, to, is something hard to master. <laughs> I can survive in German and I can survive super easily with Spanish. Right. It's really Romance close language. To, to Italian. Yeah, yeah. So when you and Daniel talk, do you speak English then or German? In, English. English. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because all our team is like bilingual, having project in U and US. Yep. We are focusing on having all the all the team bilingual. So. Wow. How incredible! I didn't know any of that, and so I didn't realize that you and Daniel have only started. So, man, you your shop has exploded then. So, Ecom House yes. went from zero to sixty really quickly. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. Just two years. Whoa. Yeah, like we 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 officially start uh, in January two thousand twenty one with the with the uh, with the hiring people. Wow. Like in in Q four two thousand twenty, we were just me and Daniel running ads in Q. What? So that's, <laughs> that's incredible. What did you guys do? How, how were you acquiring customers? Did you bring people over from what you were doing, or did you guys? How did, how did you get customer clients? <sighs> How, how I think it happened is that Daniel had a consulting about the comp. He had his own e-commerce mm-hmm. tools and so on. Then he realized that it was much more fun with the marketing yep. than dealing with the suppliers and the logistics and the customer support, all these things that we know that every comp needs to have. And then we met and, we, and he said, yeah, you know, I would have a lot of uh, small projects that could scale up if there would be someone else really pushing well the ads. Yep. So why not running a a pilot project we did and like the revenue was scaling doubling every month then we tried a second one and we said hmm it is working let's do an agency that's how the agency w- w- were born wow. then we realized that the, the, yeah the game of creative is worth picking over so we started hiring video editors as the first one then we realized that you don't scale an e-commerce just with paid media but you need all the back end so we started creating the email marketing and retention department then the media buyer team, and now the influencer marketing team, and now we provide like the marketing department basically. Yeah, the full the shop. full stack. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. So, are you still buying yeah. now, or are you just sitting over people running the strategy? Well, uh, I I'm addicted to buying. I know. Roughly, you know? I, know. <laughs> yeah. I know. I I I cannot unplug myself completely. Yeah. So we have a team, um, a media buyer team of uh, four people right now. Other four in the creative part, uh, and all the others across all the all the channels, all, all the all the departments like yep. retention, influencer marketing, yep. and so on. Right now, I tell you, I cannot step up the game when there are the bigger the biggest campaigns in Q4. Yeah. I need to be there and yeah. to add zeros to the ads manager. Yeah. I cannot like it's something that I have inside. Yeah, and and I try to write to to run the innovation about the media buying. Yep. like try to understand how. Not just to survive, but how to still exploit yep. Meta platform, yep. Facebook, Instagram, whatever, yep. as it was before I guess fourteen, even if it has changed completely. Yep. Right. Yeah. So we discussed a lot about how it has changed. Yeah. And how a lot of brands are out of the game or are risking to go out of the game doing the media buying in the same way of before, and how many others are exploiting this market share that it is getting empty from one side and feeling opportunities on the other side totally. i think there is a bit there, there are some macro trends a lot of people moving away from meta yep because it, it has become a tough game yep everyone talking about tiktok or native or google but not remembering that still at the moment the from my side, the most performant push channel is still Meta. Yep. Right? Yep. So is like for us, and it is still our unicorn. We are testing everything, but it's still our unicorn. We have 90% of our spend as an agency in yep. the Meta platform. Uh, we figure out that if we master it, as we are doing, we are getting market share from all the, all the brands, all the people going outside the platform. So we see from the problem as an opportunity yep. right because we had to so that's so fascinating so what i was actually an engineering student at one point in time 
Um, what it, how did you, so I know you typed in how to make money on that, but how did you learn all this stuff? You're probably one of the top tier media buyers. I know like you're doing some really high level stuff. How did you skill yourself up so quickly? I think burning a lot of money in tests. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, passing night just because it is, it is my passion. I love yep. it. So if I have an idea, I need to find a way to make it working. Yep. And a uh, second is like trying to go outside the platform and using the platform just a vehicle to uh, to transfer a message. Yeah, that's it. So for me, uh, Meta and the media buying just a a car that is like bringing a message to people. I love that's that it. analogy. So, yeah, but and I need to just be the best driver possible, right? So. If today something is working, three months, four months, it could be not working anymore. I know, like it's media buying, it's yeah. like technology. If uh, you, you're running a technology um, company, so you know that something today will be old in six months, yep. most likely. Yep. <laughs> so it's just the adrenaline of having fun, getting a lot of passion, and being able to reinvent the way that you are doing media buying constantly. That's like the, my keys for success. That's incredible. So how did you learn the basics? Did you already kind of understand economics and understand like no. econ? So how did you get, how did you understand that? It was, just I would say trial and error? moving from one, one pro, yeah, yeah, trial and error. Really? Project to the that other. is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I tell you, the, the beauty about engineering is that it gave gave me a really strong foundation about numbers. Yes. So for me, everything is based on numbers. Yep. Numbers are, don't lie, yep. never. So on top of that, I added my ability to create correlations yep. between things. Yep. That's like what, what you see, what you saw in Dubai. And based on that, I really found that uh, copywriting, um, psychology was not my strength. It was my yep. main attitude i found daniel and he's super strong with that field so he has been giving me the the weapons the gold yeah. weapon yeah. the gold gem to push hard yeah and that's how it goes and at the moment how i consider it is like having a ferrari and the better you a driver you become the faster you drive yeah that's incredible i did not know any of that that's that's absolutely nuts um what advice would you want to give kind of people that are trying to break into media buying too? Cause I mean, I, I didn't know any of this. And honestly, like you're one of the top media buyers I know. And I know some really great media buyers and your understanding is so high level. Um, how can people kind of gain that mastery? Is it just kind of action and try and get your hands on accounts and do, 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 or is there any frameworks or resources or you had your engineering background, which is very helpful to understand the data and understand like, because same with me where I ended up going to school for economics. So the, the financials were very, very easy to transfer over in terms of understanding how business profit margin, et cetera, et cetera. And then for ads, it's same, 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 but different, right? It's, it's kind of almost like speaking a romance language, like the conjugation similar, the vocabulary is similar ish. And so you can start to uh, almost like a Venn diagram, but, what, what advice would you give like aspiring media buyers trying to skill up like you have in such a quick time? So I think there are two personal traits to have. First of all, first of all, you need to, la uh, to love um, competitiveness, yep. being competitive yep. with, with yourself. For me, is I still uh, remember at the beginning when I started pushing really the first high budget, I would say, okay, if yesterday I spent 10K, how can I spend 15 today? being profitable on the same way and how can I go to another zero to 100k so this is like the <laughs> auto competition that I was having with myself yeah okay? and then the numbers were just there and if I see myself I was always playing competitive sports so there was a trade second you need to be in love with media buying yeah because media buying will push you down every second day <laughs> Right, so, 100%. And the more you want to push, the more you get pushed back. Yep. Because first of all, you never know what happens and you never know what is changing the platform. Yep. So this is like two personal characteristics that a strong media buyer should have, regardless of media buying skills. Yep. Second, being able to connect the dots between 
numbers and people. Oh, I love that. Everyone says that you need to understand numbers. Good. But behind every every number that we see in the in the ads manager, no matter if it is Facebook, Google, TikTok, there is a meaning of why there is that number and why people behave and gives you that number. Yep. Right? So if I see a nice met, uh, nice row of metrics for an ad, why I see uh, these numbers? It means that the people outside are triggering something yep. that is giving me those numbers. If I'm able to take it the next level and to say, good, these numbers are great because the people are thinking this or are doing this action on this ad, I'm a bit media buyer that is thinking with the behavior of people. This is not just numbers. Numbers align with people. Okay. I love that. And this is, I think, the, the biggest gap still in the market to say it's not just number. Like behind the platform, there are people. And if you don't understand the correlation between people and the numbers that you see in the ads manager or in the, in the me- media channels, it will be hard to find reasoning uh, like and reasons why one day is good and the other day is not good. Right. Why, why something is working and why something is not working. Right. And then you reverse engineer all of these. I love that. I think that's something that's so lost because I think uh, there's a lot of pendulum in uh, media buying and sometimes the pendulum can swing too far where I think there was a certain point where um, to what you're saying, people got so into the data that they forgot that there's people yeah. behind those numbers and you need to kind of swing back and you don't obviously want to just be like, oh, I'm just a people person, blah, blah, blah. Like the data matters, but you have to also remember that the data is driven by the people. And so having that nice balance of not only data driven, but also understanding the psychology and that there's an actual person making a decision behind that number is so huge. I love how you put that. And the third one that I always say is like having a minimum understanding of people, having really deep knowledge about the platform, because you need to have that. You need to understand how it works. Third, making knowledge about the business models that you are running. For example, we are really strong with e-commerce. We are not this as strong uh, as e com in lead gen. Right. Why that? Because the rules of the game are different. Totally. And so we try to adapt the media buying to the people and to the business, not Ooh, trying to adapt that. the uh, the people to the media buying or the business to the media buying. Right? Because we cannot change these two parts. Yep. We are working in the middle. So the middle needs to adapt to both parts rather than vice versa. I love that. And I think that's so well put where, um, and I'm the same where there's a lot of, when I was running my agency, uh, we were also really strong in e-commerce and we really struggled with lead gen. And we were just, we, we decided that we didn't want to play games that we couldn't win. And so we just decided if you're a lead gen business, like, we love you. You're awesome, but we're not the agency for you because we understand how to really make money for e-commerce people. And to your point, it's just a totally different skill set. The sales soccer's are longer. Like the foundational business models are just totally almost. They're not antithetical, but they're just so far apart that there's just not a lot of overlap from what you're going to do in an e-commerce and what you're going to do in a lead gen business. And then. Um, there's just a lot less in my, or from my experience, cause I, when I did, I worked at an agency before I ran my own agency and we did do some lead gen clients and there's just a lot of, uh, the attribution wasn't as tight. And so you would have this really hard, like when you're running an econ business, it's like, I spent X amount of money and I made you all this money. There's this very tight correlation between spend and success. Whereas like lead yes. gen was like this weird thing of like you wanted to balance quality of lead with quantity of lead. But then there was a lot of actors out of the play that you didn't control. Like what if the salesperson that got the lead sucked? Like is that your fault? It's not my fault that that salesperson sucks. I gave you a great lead and now the salesperson ruined the lead. And so there was just a lot of things to your point. But I love how you're thinking through that where there there's certain things that you can mold and be malleable. But there's other things that are foundational that you can't change and they need to mold around that. And a business model is absolutely one of those things. It's really clever. I love yeah. how you think through that. Um, OK, one more question for the main segment. and Then we'll move into the value add segment and get kind of nerdy. Um, what's the nicest thing that someone's done for you? Oh. 
I would say my girlfriend organizing my first birthday together. Yeah. It was a total surprise. Oh, okay. that's amazing. So, yeah, I mean, I still, we still remember all our, our um, birthdays because there is always a surprise. And like being so into the trenches in media buying, com, uh, whatever, it's rarely that I unplug completely my uh, my head. Yep. Let's be honest. Yep. Because I always think, what could I try? What what <laughs> some what new Quite is in the market? Yep. You know, it's like the fear of missing out. Yes. So when there are the big push campaigns, I cannot sleep. That's yep. the reality. Yep. I cannot sleep. <laughs> and she knows that she kicked me out of the house and say, go away, go for for a week. <laughs> But the birthdays that she organizes for me, they are just crazy. So, yeah. How fun. <laughs> and I remember all of them. So that, that's, oh, that's, that's something that is always good. That's beautiful. <laughs> is she in the Canary Islands with you? Yeah, yeah. That's she beautiful. Is, yeah. Of course. She of course. Here. That's beautiful. Um, all right. Let's get into the value add segment. Let's get into the nerdy stuff. This is why the people bought the ticket. Um, well, actually, I want to jump right into it. Um, can you explain a little bit of how you were using kind of reveal bot and how you're kind of essentially hacking the CPMs in terms of using your day parting tactics? Let's jump into that. And then I have some other questions, but that it was, it was uber fascinating to me. I hadn't seen somebody kind of put rig all these systems together to make this like all knowing robot in a way it was a, <laughs> or it's your fancy sports car. Like you, you made this yeah. incredible sports car and you could drive fast with anybody, but not only that, you would be able to stop when people would keep driving and then you could drive faster when people were driving. So kind of give, give some people some color there and tell, because most people probably don't know that we're not geek out. Yeah. So yeah. For example, if you enter today in five of our accounts, they are shut down. Yep. All campaigns are off. Yep. Okay. So if Facebook sees these things or many others sees these things, it will start giving me like, yeah, man, you are totally stupid. You are destroying the learning phase. Yep. It happens a lot of time. I, I can I can assure you. So basically, I go one step forward. For me, there are always people behind, like uh, before everything else and the behavior of people. Everyone is saying you need to master the psychology and the creative game. 100% correct. Let's suppose that we master that. We enter into the media buying. Yep. The, the motto is let's give all the power to automation and machines. And it was working really well before IS14. Yep. Even though we could have done already better there. After IS14, there was this big, big challenge that data is missing right now, is statistical modeling. So you can plug it like uh, even with triple way, you can check that some ads got sales on Facebook, but triple whales showing, A, is not so true, yeah, yeah. right? Because it is statistical. Yep. So the data that is going into Facebook is not so reliable as it was before. Yep. Third problem, it is coming up to 70, if it is coming, if it is coming after 72 hours. Yep. So Facebook right now, or Meta, and I, I fear that it will happen with all the platforms, yep. they struggle to have the live data of real people converting and giving signals to the algorithm to optimize in a really short time cycle. So what happens with that? That the data that they are seeing is like with a delay, it is coming most likely not in the perfect campaigns or ad set or ads. So it's not really reliable even for the algorithm to optimize. So my way of thinking even before was, good, if I know that all the people usually want would like to buy this product in a specific day uh, or in a specific hours or in a specific period, I want to try to put all my sales rep, all my budget, all my impression out in those specific periods yep. because I have higher chance to sell. This to say in a nutshell that always think about the offline, the impressions and the people that are buying Q4, they are different from the people that are buying Q3. Yep. So why brands are investing so much in Q4? Because they know that they can sell more. Now, let's break it down. The people who are buying at the beginning of the month, they have just received the salary, maybe yep. in Europe, yep. whatever. So they have more buying power. I try to allocate more budget at the beginning of the month because I can convert more. Let's go within the week. Uh, for a specific brand, the people are converting more in the weekend because they have more time to check the travels, for example, right now. Yep. So I try to spend more there. Yep. Let's go 
into micro again, the people who want to travel, they have more time from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. because yep. they are at home. Yep. And in the weekend, they sleep three, four hours more. I try to buy those people. That's like how I think about media buying. Okay? Yep. Now, and they go back to television. In the past, when they were selling stuff on television to men, maybe selling, you know, things about women and so on, yep. they were doing it in the night yep. or in the evening because they knew that people, they were not at home. They were there receptive for the message. With social media, we suppose that everyone on the, on the phone has the same buying intent every minute during the day, during the week. Right. That's no, not true. That's so well put. Because if I'm traveling today, it's like 8 a.m., and I go to work, I'm in the, in the metro and I check every time. At 10 a.m., I'm full into my work. And if I check the, the phone just because I want to distract myself a little bit, I still have the mind to say, ah, oh, man, I need to finish so many tasks today. So I, I give a check and then I go back. I don't have the time to think. I don't want that impression. For sure, that impression could trigger a sale after two, three days. But I want to buy the best impression that can trigger the sale right now. Okay. As a consequence, if I buy better impression over time, I just increase the efficiency and they can have better learning even in the, in the ad accounts and yep. so on. Yep. Was it clear enough on a macro level, Rabah? Yeah, absolutely. So let me say it back to people or and just say it back to you. But ultimately, I think the, the too long didn't read is people's buying intent or people aren't, aren't people are not in the same mind frame as they are yep. on the same day of week in the same hour of the day. And so what you're yep. doing is you're shifting budget to the people that have the more because ultimately you're going to spend more in areas where people are more have a higher proclivity to buy and you're going to not spend in times where you're uh, going back to your TV example. You're not selling um, TV. If you know your people are at work, you're not going to buy TV ads during the workday because you're, the people that you're showing them to are going to be people that either don't have a job so they don't have the money or they're not going to be in the right, right mind frame to buy because they are, to your exactly. point, just filling time versus now I'm home and I see, okay, cool. I'm ready. I'm relaxed. And now I want to go look at this. Oh, look at this. I'm going to buy something. I have, I'm in an area and I'm in that intent. And so you're basically arbitraging your ads to only be spent in the high intent times. And then you're lowering Absolutely. the spend or basically totally turning it off in the low intent times. So instead of actually spreading your budget out across the whole day, you're only spending in the purchase hours, if you will. Exactly. Yeah. Which is hours or days yeah. or weeks, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. So think about tools because you mentioned different tools. We have tools because obviously when there are the, the best days or hours, right. we want to spend as much as we can. Yep. We want to put outside the street as many reps as we want yep. selling our products, yep. spreading our message. So as we increase the budget like crazy and you saw in Dubai that we can go from 10K to 100K really in a few days, we need to have some kind of directions because the increase of budget is really fast. So we use automation to cut the budget. Yep. Okay. Second point, we discussed that the data is coming really late yep. in the ads manager. So how can we optimize? How can we be sure that we are spending efficiency? That's like where Triple Whale, uh, I still remember in November without it, we would have wasted so much money we can check the cost per new customer because for us paid acquisition is acquiring new customers Love that. when it is like on paid media correct like that it is meta yep. platform for us so with these two tools we can say good we have some boundaries where we cannot go over uh, and we put the machine really, the, the car really straight. Yep. So when we can speed, we speed. When we need to break down, we break down. We have a tool that is telling us on a business level, not on ads manager. We don't care about the ads manager. If the, the impression that we are buying, the people that we are showing our message are converting with a click or not, if this is happening, the tool, the business tool is telling us spend more because we are within the KPIs. If the tools, if the cost per new customer is going down, is going too high, 
is telling us you are going outside the best hours. Slow down or you are, you are just speeding too much. Okay. And I closed the circle saying we based a lot of cost per new customers. Why that? Because we found other ways to use other channels to decrease the cost of media buying. Okay. Cost of Facebook. And it was something that I was uh, showing in Dubai. Basically, we realized that every time we have an email push, an influencer posting, there, are, there is so much traffic going into the sites that this is like giving meta signals to say, hey, this site is so legit, the people are having such a nice experience that you should bring higher quality and even more people. Yep. Facebook re meta rewards us with cheaper traffic. Yep. So what do we do? We spend more. Yep. Right, because yep. we are reaching more people in the best hours, and for we are, cheaper uh, for a cheaper hour, so we can even acquire more customers. Right, and what is again the KPI that is uh, telling us if we are doing it right or, or wrong? The cost per new customer. Yep, because a lot of people from an email push will pull down the CPA, but not the new customer CPA. Right, right. Yeah, not incremental. So, not incremental. And then what last topic that before every push we think is like, good, what is the maximum cost per new customer that I can afford yep. in order to have a nice LTV on that new customer? Yep. And this is like where for us is like the, the core of every scaling that we do, mostly when it is really aggressive. It's like, what is the correlation between the cost per new customer and LTV? How much we can afford to have profitability, maybe not in the first purchase, but after three months, yep. which is the product that is giving us the best ratio, not the best CPA, the best ratio between cost per acquisition and LTV profit, right? I love it. So yep. there, there are multiple skills here. I would say in a nutshell, trying to buy the impressions where people are hot yep. to buy, they are really there to buy. Second. Trying to buy, try to direct those impressions to the product, the unicorns that are giving you the best incremental value for the business with the lifetime value, not just the cost per acquisition with the lifetime value. Third, try to lower down the cost of this uh, media buying with other channels, right? So this is like in a really five minutes story all the things that are uh, allowing us to, to push so hard on media buying, on acquisition. It's incredible. I mean, that's absolutely mind blowing. So you're spending more during the higher intent periods. You're tying that back to your customer acquisition costs, but you're also ensuring that the LTV will then net out against that new customer acquisition. And then on top of that, all the returning customers that you're getting are just putting money in the bank and you don't care about them, but there's still a lift to the business. It's still great, but at the same time, like that's yeah. not what you're basing your ad spend off of. And then furthermore, you're putting the turbo boosters on and saying, hey, an influencer or perhaps a, a, a listicle or some sort of uh, press post that went live or something like that, then brings me into, so now Facebook's gonna give me not only that I'm in the high intent period, but because I'm getting this incredible engagement on my post, they're going to give me the traffic for cheaper. So I can even, I get more money or more impressions for my money. And so it's just all these exactly. tailwinds that exactly. just make everything exactly. go faster, faster, faster. But then at the same time, you have the emergency break where it's like, hey, if my NCCPA goes over this, we need to stop. It's, I don't care if money's coming in because those money, that's not incremental. I care about how many new customers exactly. I'm bringing in. And so if, the influencer brings in all these returning customers. That's great. You're printing money, but at the same time, I'm not going to spend paid media on those people. I only want my incremental conversions. Exactly. That's beautiful. Exactly. That is a really cool so, way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. So, and basically I tell you what we are doing right now. We are thinking already, which kind of influencers, which kind of funnels are bringing yeah. us right now. We are in April, end of April. I was checking in the calendar. Uh, which kind of influencer are driving the highest performance marketing, the highest sales, which kind of funnels are acquiring the best leads? Because the sooner we go to uh, Q4, the more assets we have, the more we can plug and play to bring down the cost of media buying when it will be the most competitive period, yep. but even the most, uh, the, the highest in intent period yep. for buying intent for people. Yep. So. 
Uh, and I think uh, what I was sh uh, showing there in Dubai is like how we were bringing down the CPM from, I, I don't remember if it was $20 to 12 or 13. It was a in lot. Just one hour. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it was 35% decrease in CPM and the spend was going from 2K per hour to 10K per hour. Yep. So you maximize the reach, right? That for sure is easier to scale because you reach more people <laughs> with the same budget. So and you're reaching more people in a higher intent period, which is like, exactly, the, like exactly. that that that's the trick, right? It's like of course you can reach more people for cheaper in terrible times. Like Facebook's trying to unload that traffic on anybody that wants to buy it. But to, it, you're not only you're going to the best club with the richest people and you're getting in for a cheaper cover charge than everybody else. Like, I mean, it's absolutely perfect. And then the objection, I, there is always the objection, is incremental. Does it make sense to micromanage right now the account? I still don't have, I need to be honest, the end goal answer, like the, the final answer for us is increasing the efficiency by 20 to 30% yep. of the media buying. So it's like making Facebook scalable. Uh, that's like what is missing to a lot of brands. The other, I always think, we realize that whenever we leave the, the media buying the budget managed by Facebook, we have really big slots of inefficiencies. Some could say, yeah, but I'm buying impressions that will get the first priming to then convert after. Sure. So it makes sense even mostly when we go with brands doing more than 50 mil a year. Yep. Okay. You, you need less of the cash flow, direct cash flow that maybe smaller brands uh, are needing. But... If we think what happens in the offline world, uh, if I going into a vacation, right, in the beach, and I, I have a, a sushi restaurant that is like coming out with a rep and trying to bring me in saying, hey, you should try this sushi because it is amazing, it's fresh, it's like super tasty at 11 a.m. when I just have eaten breakfast, I would say, no, thanks. And they would not even remember that. Yep. If the same rep, of their sushi restaurant is coming out at 1 p.m. where I'm really um, hungry, yep. right? But maybe I have already chosen to go for a pizza today. I will still remember because my intent to, to eat is much higher. Yep. So the retention of that impression is much higher. Yep. And tomorrow, if I pass by there, I will go to the sushi restaurant, yep. right? So that's why I always think that the impressions is not, they have different value because they have different value buying intent. Okay. If we like it or not, yep. then if we, if we can wait, we always push really uh, impulsive behaviors products. That's why we want to convert them as soon as possible. And if we always want to convert as fast as we can, I still believe in direct response marketing. Yeah. Then the branding will come over time and the yep. more a brand will grow, mostly after 20, 30, 50 millions a year, we can micromanage less. But why should we? That's like my question. If we say that this is like improving efficiency, why should we not do that? Right? 100%. I, I think too, again, like everybody's going to have different experiences. So you should definitely test. But I think the thesis is incredibly strong where you're going to be, again, you're going to be spending your, the majority of your budget in the higher intent hours that's going to be more impactful impressions. The the more you can do that, the better off you're going to be versus spreading out your budget and 30% of it's going to be wasted in non high intent hours. And I agree with you. There's people that um, when you when you're in that intent phase, that that's the number one thing they tell you is like the first place to get is get them to say no to you. Like at least you're in the consideration set. But if I am offering you something that you're not in, in like your sushi pizza example, like, okay, now I'm in the consideration set. I don't want sushi right now, but okay. But if I just had breakfast and I have zero, I'm like, oh, what, what is this silly ad? I, and you just, you're not in the buying intent. So you're never going to enter that consideration set. You're not even saying no to that. You're literally just going to discard it. Exactly. Exactly so. So it's a big theme about people behavior apply to media buying. Yeah. Yeah, we go we go back to what we were yeah, thinking. The, the balance not of... adapting people exactly, not adapting media buying to people, but uh, no, not adapting people to media buying, right. but media buying to people. Yep. And then all, all, almost even more so a layer deeper than that, 
adapting them to where they're at in their day or their psyche. Right. Because people are yes, different exactly. in different times. It's like when I'm working, I'm not buying anything. If somebody shows me a sneakers ad when I'm working, I'm not I'm just going to throw it away. But when I'm sitting on the TV and then I see like the, the sneaker apps are so good at that, they send you the, uh, the notifications right when they know you're like, oh, this is cool. Oh, man, I should probably look at that. Like in, in your kind of day times that you're really into it. So I love that, man. That is one of the coolest things. And uh, the presentation you did was so, so incredible. And again, people, he's not just talking nonsense. He's doing this like this is I, I saw the numbers. I've seen the data and it, it, he's he's making moves with this. So that's incredible. Um, what a cool explanation. Thank you for taking everyone through that. Um, what do you guys look for in the perfect client? First of all, a product that is doing good for the world. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is delivering happiness. Uh, what do I mean with that? That when I buy, I want to talk with you about how good was this product. Yeah. Uh, this is like a... Uh, I told you that I was in Africa doing some volunteering yeah. uh, with kids, with orphans. So we really believe in ethicality in the market. Yeah. Okay. In the media. We have the chance with media buying, with e-com to spread millions of products around the world. So yeah. we have a big impact. So for us, it needs to be something good to sell. Love it. How do we check if the reviews are great? Retention rate is great. Return it's rate. Easy to understand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Returning rate. Yeah. People are talking, yeah. most likely every e-com brand should have a Facebook group community. And you, you see immediately yep. if the product is loved or if, if it is the last drop shipping product that is just dropping. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We don't want that. Yeah. Right? So it, already Meta is putting the, these things away, but like uh, we try to do our best. Second, it needs to be something that can be bought in a short time cycle. What does it mean? It needs to be something impulsive. Yep. from a behavior point of view, purchase behavior point of view. Because this way we know that if we invest today, we don't need to wait three days before taking the action. We realize that the most impulsive behavior of product in US are up to 150, yeah. maximum $200. 200 is already on the high end. People will match the investment to the monthly salary. And they think, ah, maybe it's like 5%, 10% of my monthly salary. I will think tomorrow. Yep. That's already is lower to, to push. Third, they need to have um, Meta, uh, Facebook ads as main unicorn channel for acquisition yep. because it is like our mastery. Yep. For sure, Google or the other things are helping, but we want to acquire new customers. Third, they want to grow fast. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we get bored when the, the, the brands say, yeah, we'd like to grow 30% year over year. How can we go to 100%, 200%? Yeah, double. Okay. Um, usually the other thing is we really understood that we have fun when there is the business owners close to the brand. Yes. And usually it, because it is there, you know, it is, we are a startup. We are two young guys. You met us and we love the adrenaline to say, yes. guys, we are going so fast. Go can we go faster? Yeah. Right. So, and it, it is hard. We work with some corporations above the 20, 30 mil a year. It's hard to have this kind of things because there is a management, there is the mm. CMO with 10 mm. team members, not yeah. just a CMO with a small team. Yeah. Processes, then the branding that is limiting the ads. Yeah. So we, we will say that the, our sweet spot is always between one and 10 million yeah. that want to go to 20, 50 millions a year. I love that. Okay. That's incredible. Because there is, there is, you know, I don't know. I'm really uh, adrenalinic yeah. as, a, as a person, Daniel as well. Yeah. So we say, if we scale a brand of the business owner that is there with a small team, the satisfaction that is there is so fulfilling to us. And we see the smile about him selling the product maybe he was dreaming. That's just insane. This comes back immediately to us. So it's incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful. It's, it's having fun. It's having fun. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, at, at the end of the day, too, that's it. That's it. Where like, are you enjoying? Are you feeling fulfilled? And I love that you have the ethical bent of like, you know, are we are we helping promote products that are generating value for people? Because if not, then it gets a little unique, and they're like, oh, I don't, you know, 
I'm a big capitalist, but I want to make my money in an honorable way. I don't like to kind of ah, shill out same, crap to people. Where same, it's like, same. I want I'm value yeah. for value, you know? And so it's kind of... And a, I always think about this way. If I buy something that online, still a lot of people are not buying online. So we need to remember, US is like the driver. China yep. is like... A, but in Europe, in Italy, there are still a lot of people not buying online. Really? If the first, yeah. Yeah, if the first purchase that they buy is a crap, they will not trust it anymore. I don't want to make that. I want to promote the growth of the sector because it is good for everyone. Everyone. Right? It has given me myself freedom to live whenever I want with a team of 20 people remote. Uh, travel. Like We have a chance that it has never been there. Let's use it for good. Right? So It's beautiful, man. It's a simple. It's a choice. It's beautiful. Okay, one last question and we'll get into the rapid fire. Where do you see the e-com industry going or what do you see happening in e-com in the next one to two years? So, first of all, it has become much more complicated. The multi-channel that everyone was preaching, um, it, it was a nice to have. Now it is a must. And think about how I see the multi-channel. It needs to be there even to help meta scaling super fast because it is still the unicorn of performance marketing from my point of view, yep. from my personal opinion. Uh, differentiating channel is like needed. TikTok will, I'm bullish, it will explode in the next years. Yep. Maybe already next year. It just need to become more stable as a platform in the advertising channel and so and in the in the back end. Um, I'm I feel that Meta will try to uh, bring in more and more the entire customer journey of the user with shops on Meta, shops on Instagram and so on to get the full data uh, flow as Amazon is doing, right? I don't know if it is a good or a bad because we could lose the, really the property of the customers right. and so on. Yeah. But this is like what I'm envisioning. And the growth is massive, is, is there. Like it, it is just uh, there to explode more and more. And last thing that I envision, a lot of US brands coming more and more to Europe yeah, because of the cost of advertising and so on and the appeal of the Euro European market yeah. uh, in terms of buying power and like scalability. That's fantastic. Yeah, we're seeing that a little bit in our data as more people come online, uh, kind of like the EU, like the Germany's, the France, the Italy's, the Spain's. It, really, Germany and France are the big powerhouse economies over there, but... Um, we have a big presence I mean, if, in the UK, but it's starting to jump across the pond into the European continent. If, if you think about that, in, I think in US there are 330, 350 million people. Right? Yeah, so give, give or take around that. Yeah. Okay. In the German speaking language is like 100 million people yeah. in Europe. Yeah. So it's one third of US. Yeah. So and it's, it's super scalable. It, well, and there's it's a massive economy. They have money too. Exactly. It's not just like a, exactly. a you know a bunch of people would, would know like India or something where India is a ton of people, but there's like three people that have money to buy things in India. Where like Germany and France are you know decent sized countries that also have a lot of disposable income to buy uh, these absolutely. these products. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. You man, well, you made it to the rapid fire. Are you ready? I love it. All right. I love it. First milestone. Okay. Munich, overrated or underrated? Uh, I'm I'm <laughs> overrated, underrated. I would say underrated. Oh really? Okay, cool. I've been wanting to go to Germany. Munich seems cool. Like, I, good I, public I, transit, I, right? I, lo I loved I loved living there. Yeah. Uh, ideally, I will have one fixed a spot there yeah. to live in the summer, and then in the winter we come here in the Canarias Beautiful. because of the weather. Yeah. But it's amazing. I love Germany. Did you do Berlin as well? Or did you get to travel around or just Munich? Not a lot. Uh, mostly Munich because yeah. there are the lakes, there are the mountains. Mm -hmm. So I love the nature. Same. Mostly to go out of the of the, of the PC yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> during the week. So, so, and yeah, and it is close to Italy. So for me, it was the perfect. Oh, it is perfect overrides. for you. I didn't even think of the geography. Yeah, that is perfect for you. <laughs> um, Working, co-owning an agency, overrated, underrated? Um, overrated. Yeah, yeah. Why that? Because it's not as easy as many are describing, right? So for me, building an agency is like building a big HR department. <laughs> of 
got of great people, but when you want to push art, it's hard to find the great people still yes. right now. Yes. So there are some challenges. And everyone say, yeah, from solopreneurs goes to do the agency. Man, I mean, be ready to start losing some hair, you see here. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, but I love the journey. I suggest everyone to enter on that. But don't expect that it is easy because you have to deal with people. I was always working as a freelancer and and then you need to learn many other skills, yep. not just pushing ads. Very but I love it. Yeah, very eloquently put. I love that. Um, volunteering, overrated, underrated? Bah, overrated. Changed my life. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate every single thing that I have right now. Yeah. I tell you, I, I was in a tough situation. No, not in a tough. I was unhappy with my life. Yeah. And I had everything. So I don't, don't ask me why I went to volunteering. It happened. I came back. I said, man, now I can achieve whatever I want. Uh, in the in my worst day, I will be still most likely right. most lucky than maybe sixty percent of the world. Yeah, that's like how I live when there is a challenge right yeah. now. That's so perfectly put. I think gratitude can really be a, a very good grounding force. Where and you're... and I give the last clue: volunteering is an egoistic fact rather than altruistic. Yeah. You think that you go there to make some good things, and you do that. Yeah. But at the end, you take much more in a in a positive way yeah. than you give. Yeah. yeah. So it's hard to explain, but yeah, no, no, underrated. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, on that bent, Kenya, overrated or underrated? Did you enjoy Kenya? I I loved Kenya. It's really unsafe. Yeah. If you go to Nairobi, yeah. If nah. you go to Nairobi, I appreciate the the safety of Italy, even though Italy maybe is not the best, but like still is much safer than yeah, than Nairobi. I've heard that as well. Um, yeah, Kenya is amazing. Like uh, I highly recommend everyone to do a safari. Yes. In in Africa. Yeah. Because finding the elephants really two meters or the the lions two meters far away from you is an experience that. Uh, Hard to hard to describe. The landscapes are crazy, and the culture you really feel that uh, how maybe fifty years ago or yeah. one hundred years ago yeah. it was where we live right now. Yeah. So it's amazing. Uh, speaking multiple languages, overrated or underrated? Underrated. Underrated. So you're Italian, because English, and a bit of German. Ger a bit of German and Spanish. Oh, it's Spanish. And yeah, yeah. Before. Before or after, I will learn Chinese. Oh, Just really? Because I, it's supposed to be a hard yeah, one. Yeah, forecast Mandarin in the next be very 10 hard. years. Yeah, good challenge. There you go. But look how the world how the world is like shaping the change. Oh, no. I think in the next 10 years, there will be big opportunities there. You're right. Uh, I think you're right. And I, I'm not amazing with languages. I have my girlfriend that she pick, uh, picks up the language like this. I'm the opposite. Yeah. But English, English changed my life. Yeah. So, and every language that I had, <laughs> is like opening new culture and like it's a great new, point. new opportunities. That's a really good point. Uh, crypto, overrated or underrated? I'm not an expert. I cannot judge. Okay. I, I bought tw <laughs> I <laughs> I bought a little bit when everyone was saying bye bye bye. Yeah. Uh, after two days, everything collapsed. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, it's better if it's learned. better if I stay if I focus on on ecom. That is like my goal. Uh, I cannot judge. That's really. funny. That's so funny. <laughs> Um, Italian cuisine, overrated or underrated? I love it. Underrated. underrated. It will always stay my best. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I can ask everyone, do you love pizza? <laughs> everyone will just say so. And the things like everyone talk about only pizza and lasagna. There are so many other things that if you go to Italy, every time that I go back to Italy, I gain two, three kilos. <laughs> so There you go. <laughs> Uh, UGC, overrated or underrated? I would say overrated Ooh. if we consider the old way of running them. Okay. okay. Why the old way? The old way was saying, put a UGC and you will crush it. Yeah. The new way is like, and it is underrated. So I, I, You're it's like, put a, a UGC that it is talking the language that, and the problems that the people want to hear yep. outside yep. and you will crush it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So segment the UGCs and what is saying within the videos and the UGCs based on the people outside and you will crush it. Yeah. The general one are dead. Overrated. Love it. 
Uh, TikTok, overrated or underrated? Um, yeah, there is a, a li- right now, right right now, a little bit overrated. Okay. Uh, because it seems that TikTok is the solution for everything. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Um, it will be underrated next year because I f- I think it could be the second really big leg on the chair uh, next to next to Facebook. Yeah. I never believe that a lot in Pinterest, Snapchat. Yep. I believe a lot in TikTok. Yeah, I, I'm 100 with you. Um, kind of going across that cuisine. Uh, favorite meal and why? Uh, um, favorite meal and why? Oh wow, I like the the steak. Ooh, so. Yeah. Uh, why it's hard to say it's just uh, good in all the countries you can find it uh, and it is different from australia to us to italy to spain so it's always the same piece of meat but like it uh, it is done all different in yeah. all the countries yeah. so i love a good yeah, steak when, i would say so when you come to austin we'll, we'll have a nice steak there's there's some really nice steak, steak houses out here texas texas knows how to do meat very well uh, i love it i love it. favorite way to spend your time yeah, uh, well, with my girlfriend going into the nature, um, yeah, mountains and so on, really pushing away phones and whatever. I'm not really good at that right now, <laughs> to be honest. But when I go, I said, ah, man, that's nature. That's like uh, the talks and time with her. I just love her I'm, so much. <laughs> I am absolutely the same as it, man. When I get to go out into nature with her, it's the, the, there's something. Because like you said, we're so tight and so ingrained in technology daily that it's so nice to, and it goes back to the other thing too, uh, gratitude. When you start to go, cause we we like to go camp and do backpacking and kind of get, get a little rough in nature. And you're like, man, it's nice to have like climate control and a soft bed. And like, it it makes those things even better. Yeah. Like, yeah, crazy. And uh, align with that is traveling because you discover all these new people and like, new nature yep. and you understand how big is this world at yep. the end and how many people do it differently which is totally fine yeah absolutely it's very cool absolutely yeah um favorite book uh the compound effect oh that's a good i haven't that's a good pick i like that um all right last, it is it is everywhere last yeah one, go, go. last question you ready if you could have dinner with three people dead or alive Fictional or non-fictional, who would you, who would they be? So you're at a dinner table. There's four people there or three people there, and you're sitting at the head. Who gets an invite to dinner? Um, David Oggins for yeah. the motivational part. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you read the book. You yeah. Can't hurt me. Yeah. Wow, that's a tough question. Then I would say, I don't know. It's a tough question, this it's one. It's tough. It's, that's you why it's rapid me fire, fire. Emmanuel. That's why it's the God. rapid fire. God, God, God. So you got David Goggins. Yeah, uh, I would say, I, I, I would say, um, Nelson Mandela. For yeah. Oh, everything that interesting. Good. Yeah, South Africa. And and um, I, um, I would say, Mother Teresa. Oh, for interesting. All the good that she did for for this world. Interesting. So you got so Nelson Mandela. Mother Teresa and David Goggins. That is an interesting dinner, Emmanuel. That is fascinating. Yeah, I don't know what could <laughs> come after. <laughs> like, you know, That's one a... super motivation. <laughs> uh, very, very cool. But it will be about a lot of values. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Emmanuel, you're the best. Thank you so much. Tell people how they can get involved with Ecom House. How can they follow you? This time is yours, my friend. Uh, I mean, you can follow me. Just type in my name on Google, Emanuele Maragno. Uh, or following me on LinkedIn, Ecomouse, you just type uh, www.ecomouse.com. You will see me speaking here and there at some conferences, so for sure you will hear from me in the future. And what else? Just following this podcast and applying the things. I think this is like my biggest thing. Rather than following me, follow the, the value here, because if you have a good product or you are selling good products, it's like our responsibility to sell more, right? To impact more and more people. That's like how I see it. Spreading the good, spreading the light you are, Emmanuel. You're, you're just such a gem of a human. Thank you so much, my friend, for coming on. You're the best. 
If you do want to get more involved Thanks with Triple Whale, well, we are at trytriplewell.com, and then we are on the Bird app at Triple Whale, well, and then we have a fantastic newsletter that goes out every Tuesday and Thursday. You can s- subscribe right on our website or on our uh, ch- Twitter profile, excuse me, at Triple Whale. Well. Emmanuel, enjoy the sunshine. Enjoy the Canary Islands with Thanks, your girlfriend. Everybody. Thank you so much. And then uh, when you come out to Austin, let me know. When I get to that side of the world, I'll let you know, and we'll, we'll link up again. Lovely. We'll catch up soon. All right. Thank See you, you. Thanks for inviting. Anytime, my friend. Thanks so much. Bye.